Ready? Yeah. We're ready to start, everybody. And so um, we're in Matthew chapter three tonight, and um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna meet. We're gonna introduce a new character this evening, and um, and it's really great we get to see him. So um, and get to learn a little bit more about what he's doing. So without further ado, I will go ahead and read about him right now. So I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. And it goes like this. Now in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is, is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and honey. That tells you a little bit about him. Probably not <laughs> Mr. Probably wasn't invited to a lot of parties. Yeah. I know. I, I, I hear people um, try to say, I guess there was something called a locust that was not actually the bug locust. I guess it was a reference. You think? I, 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 I'm going to stick with the locust, the bug. They're pretty big. I, I guess they would have a, a little it, bite that, of food there. But there was a it's some kind of a plant or something that people say that was also considered the same name, but... There's hey, a lot I'm of people eating a lot of stranger things these days, so... We can't really judge. And I think it's a lot of times people just try to think, oh, that's so gross, let's think of something else it might be. So it looks like an apple. <laughs> no, just it doesn't really, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Sardina said, um, not a fashionist. Yes. No, not a fashionista at all. Yeah. Um, and you might wonder, you, you're like, well, you know, if, if you only had the book of Matthew, you would say, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Yeah. Thankfully, we have all four Gospels, and so we get to know a little bit more about him. In John chapter 1, you get to, to know that he was actually a relative of Jesus, and, you know, and he, he, was very, he was older than Jesus, Jesus' human body, um, by you know, just months. And so you get to know a lot more about him. But Matthew is writing this, um, Matthew is writing this book, this letter, to the Israelites, and what are they concerned with? They're concerned with the fulfillment of prophecy right. because that's where their head is. Also, you know, like if somebody came and delivered your pizza, um, you what would you be concerned about? You'd be concerned about receiving the pizza, receiving the message, and so they're 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 not as interested as in you know like who is this guy. The guy who comes and delivers your pizza, you're not going to ask him who his relatives are, um, where he lives, what he's doing. You don't care about that. You care about the pizza. And so the Israelites cared about the message and not so much about the messenger. And they cared about the fulfillment of prophecy. And so when you kind of think about it like that, it makes sense that Matthew didn't do a whole background story on right. John the Baptist. Yeah, um, when it comes to pizza, I think about price. No, I'm just saying, that's the kind he's, of guy I am. He's taken... How much does it cost me? <laughs> Give said, me a Costco pizza. There you go. You but don't no. you don't care about uh, the guy <laughs> no, so yeah, much. Yeah. You don't care about no, the guy. Um, so. But it is. But it's it is what you're you're thinking. About. I've actually, yeah, pretty picky about the pizza. Um, but as far as um, yeah, Matthew, he has a, sp a specific audience that he's um, speaking to and. Yeah, and he and he rolls right out with right. the with the prophecy. So it's right here, right yeah. in the beginning of verse three. You want to talk about that? Um, were you going to talk about it? No. Okay. Verse three um, was the. Why am I missing three? Verse um, three. For this reason, one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, "The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and make his path straight." So. There was a long period of time, uh, we think it was like 400 years, that um, there was silence. Um, there was no real prophecies at the end. And John the Baptist is 
entering the scene. Um, you, you know the story of John the Baptist because of Matthew's writing um, previously, just a chapter before, talking about um, their related um, in, in the aspect of being cousins, and then um, th about six months apart, right? Um, six months difference about there. And this Old Testament prophecy is prophesying about this prophet, this man that's going to come and uh, make the way or um, introduce the Savior. And it's just interesting how connected this is. So all the, all the silence that happened, all of a sudden there's this great news. So I think that's for us too. Um, I always think that when there's a long silence from God, look for the big miracle. Um, just wait for it. It's coming. Just wait for it. Be patient. I know we all hate to do that, but be patient. All those years that there was just like, seemed like no prophecies coming up. And then all of a sudden there's John the Baptist and mm -hmm. going to introduce um, and, and fulfill this prophecy, but preparing the way of God. Okay, come. Right. So um, John the Baptist, it says that uh, he was preaching in the wilderness and that also is part of the prophecy, yep. right? Um, but his, what he says is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so this word repent, um, it, it means change your mind or it means change your direction. Yeah. Like 180 degrees. If you're right. going this way, you know, turn around and go the other way. And so that was that was his big um, that was his message. Yeah. That was his message. We're gonna it see was... the people that came to him in a minute, but that was what he was preaching. And it was a um, it's a military and the military uses this um, about face. Um, it's it's going the opposite direction and that's mm -hmm. what same stop going the way that you're going mm -hmm. and that sinfulness and turn to our savior. Yeah. Yeah. And when you when you repent, you stop that rebellion or you stop running from God, right? You begin to follow God's way that is prescribed in his word. And so that is true repentance. I know a lot of times we talk about repentance and true repentance because sometimes we you know, like maybe we get a start, but it's it's a false start. But yeah. but the good news is is that you do not have to clean yourself up to to do this. In fact, the second that you repent, the second that you turn around and go another direction, you're still messy, right? You're still you know maybe yeah. you're still an alcoholic, maybe you're still you know um, a, li a laundry list of things. Um, but the idea is that going the other direction will lead to a whole different kind of life and a life focused on God. Yeah, and so repentance and forgiveness are two different things. Um, when you ask for forgiveness, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean you, you repent. And a lot of people get that confused. Repent is actually stopping the direction you're going and going the opposite direction. Um, forgiveness, I people ask for forgiveness all the time and then they go repeat what they've done. Um, and uh, we see this a lot, especially in today's society. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so sorry. And then they go and do it again. Um, the difference in um, when you repent is you're actually going to turn away from that. And like you were saying, um, alcoholic, uh, unless God really cleanses you immediately from that, takes that desire away, um, maybe it's possible. He, it is possible and we've seen it we've seen it I've happen seen it. and that is but but God also sometimes lets you fight it out you you gain your Christian maturity through the steps and the process it takes to lean on to God and away from your addictions um, and that 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 process that you go through God goes through it with you but sometimes you will be tempted to do these things but guess mm -hmm. what you learn I was just talking to somebody this week um, don't put yourself in a place that where your weaknesses are. For example, if you're an alcoholic, do not go around alcohol. I mean, don't go to <laughs> don't, don't go, go to, to the, the bar. bar. <laughs> um, skip that aisle on the, uh, the at, at, store, yeah, yeah. Skip that yeah. aisle. You know, um, <laughs> um, you don't need to go there. Um, but it's it's you start processing how your life is going to be. I want to live like Christ. Therefore. I need to stay away from these things. Um, mm -hmm. Sexual immorality. You know what? If if that's a, if that's an issue um, and you're struggling with that, mm -hmm. don't put yourself in that place. 
don't close the doors uh, with your computers, right? Um, don't don't be alone with um, the opposite sex that you're you know you're attracted to. Don't be alone. With, bring some other friends with you so you don't get in that place that you, you sit. And uh, so anyway, so repentance is that there is that that maturity that process that you can work through, but it takes God leading you and you're following God. You're following Him, and that's the key. Mm -hmm. following Christ and he'll get rid of the sin you don't yeah. have to worry yeah he'll get rid of the sin you just need to follow and so that's another thing I think we we want to figure it out how am I going to do this like you're starting a diet or something you're like well what can I eat and when should I start just follow Jesus just ask for forgiveness I think it's a good start oh yeah, yeah. no and you do then, but also repent. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. But then it's turn, turn from it. Turn, yeah. Turn it's the action that's the required. Way. Ask for forgiveness, but turn then, from it. Yeah. Don't don't say, "Oh God, I'm so sorry I did that." And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, too many people do that. They continue in their sin, and that's um, Jesus says yeah. a few times, "Go and sin no more." And he he wouldn't say it if it wasn't possible. So yeah, go and right. sin no more. So the other thing that John the Baptist is preaching is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in my commentary, it kind of gives a good paraphrase of this. It says, the kingdom of heaven began when God himself entered human history as a man. Today, Jesus Christ reigns in the hearts of believers, but the kingdom of heaven will not be fully realized until all evil in the world is judged and removed. Christ came to earth first as a suffering servant but he will come again as a king and judge to rule victoriously over all the earth. So and, um, kingdom of God is good. Oh, John's got a good one. Okay, first, uh, Sardinas um, said, um, and um, ask for guidance too. Yes. Oh, that'd be good. Um, yeah, that'd the be whole good. thing to repentance and forgiveness <laughs> is following Christ. And to follow Christ, you ask for that. God, lead me. Mm -hmm. Take me the direction. Because I mean, this is a new process, right? You're learning a new lifestyle. You're learning a new way to live. And so, yes, you do. Yeah. John says um, you you go to, to repentance in the way God wants you to go through in order for you to be able to serve him in later times because the things you go through, you'll be uh, able to help other people. Mm -hmm. um, and later things, when... When you begin to get into the ministry of God and working for God. And I will say this. If you are a believer, you are working for God. So John is right on it. Um, don't think you become a believer and then all of a sudden you're, you're done. No, it's all of a sudden you have a job to do. And it is we are to disciple others. Mm -hmm. We are to lead others to Christ. We are to minister to others. We are to be an example. And um, our goal, what's the, I think I brought it up last week, what the, was, was the shirt that I saw, um, um, this is not my home, I'm just here recruiting, and um, so we, we are here recruiting, we're here recruiting because our home's in heaven, and yeah. we're just trying to take as many people with us as possible while we're here in this time, so yeah, great, and um, I think it is the um, um, repentance and the way God takes you through it is absolutely I think everything in our life, God's using it to train you for something else. And I know some people, and I'm not saying God sent them through this to make this happen, but whatever you've been through, whatever you're going through, God's going to use that. It's not like he, he wanted you to. It's just whatever the path you chose or whatever you went through. And I, I, I'll tell you, I mean, there was some people that I know that um, really heavy into sex and in, into drugs um, doing some real crazy stuff and you would think oh they're never going to get saved well when they turned to God and became a believer and now they're on fire um, for God they are just nothing can stop them but it's all those things that they did wrong they now know what other people are going through they know um, and they're able to witness to them where seriously people people have told me this Paul you don't understand you've never done drugs well, guess what? I know some people that have, and they're believers, and you can talk to them because they do. But you, but it's it is it's a, a people need somebody to say, um, I need you to understand what I'm going through. Now the truth is Jesus understands, and that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. But it is good that 
God uses our past experiences, good or bad, to use us in places that we can minister. That's right. All right, well, let's go on. And we're in Matthew 3. I'm going to pick up in verse 5. And I think I'll, I'll surprise you as to where I end. All right, three, Matthew 3, 5. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, John the Baptist, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that these stones, that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So here he is. We, we just got to look at his outfit and his diet. Now we find out that this is, this is a pretty big thing. This is, it says Jerusalem's going out to him and all Judea, um, which is the country that Jerusalem is in. Um, and all the district around the Jordan. So this is quite a lot of this is quite a lot of area. Um, and so it says that they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. So we know where he was. He was at the Jordan River, and they confessed their sins. And so this was the process. And I guess he he did the preaching, and it was convicting. And these people were coming to um, to be baptized and repent of their sins. Right. They didn't know the next part, but that's what they were doing in this part. Yeah, and um, John the Baptist. Um, I don't know when he when his parents died, but they were old when he was born. They were. Yeah. They were. And, um, his mom was too old to bear children. Yeah. And um, I don't know if it was. Uh, uh, what, what age he was, but um, this lifestyle that he has is very different, um, it seems, from the rest of society at that time. But then look at the people that just draw to him. <laughs> He's, it's, they're just people from everywhere come around to hear him, to be baptized by him. Mm -hmm. Just amazing. And um, it just shows that there's something that God can do in your life and our life and he can do it abundantly if we just it doesn't matter what your lifestyle is I, I eat mayonnaise on everything mayonnaise on spaghetti mayonnaise on chili it's a weird thing but Pray I think him. biblically speaking it's just like John the Baptist God uses people that eat weird stuff that's a stretch all right may, but, maybe yeah, I'm stretching that's, that's, it, but, good. that's good that's but, good but um <laughs> I love mayonnaise. I just, um, and so I think he's hungry. Yeah, yeah that's right. I think right. he's probably. But um, but it is. It's a, the whole locust thing was weird. Um, but with mayonnaise, it's probably okay. So, but the idea is, he he lived a different lifestyle than everybody. He did not. He he actually he had some authority. He could have used um, his priesthood. He could have used a lot of things. But it, the lifestyle he chose and the way he's obviously following God, God's direction. And um, well, and he the, was in the in the priestly line yeah right he was in the priestly line which would have made which would have called for the fact that he would at some point worked in the temple yeah um and maybe that maybe his parents passed away before like that um transition was made but it says that he lived in the wilderness and he had lived in the wilderness for quite a while yeah. so this is interesting because he is in the priestly line um he should have been, you know, like arm in arm with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But because he had lived in the wilderness, because he had been set apart for God and set apart his whole life mostly, um, he never fell into all of the sin or all of the stuff that, our, that their culture and our culture partake in. So he was the perfect guy to then be able to say, repent because he never partook in that stuff. And so Jesus, God, 
the Holy Spirit, they had a plan for John the Baptist. And the plan was is that he would be separate from society and that he would then be able to call them out because they couldn't say, well, John, what about when you did this and when you did that? They couldn't say it. Right. Dude's been in the wilderness. Yeah. And, uh, and so he's pure, I guess, you know, yeah. is an interesting and way I, to say it. I think that, too, it's um, by not following the traditional teachings and priesthood or yeah, whatever reason. Um, he was coming with a different message. He was actually coming with the truth. Um, yeah. That, that was the big difference. And say, let's put this in today's um, perspective as well. If you speak the truth, no matter how much society is against it, people are going to seek it. They want to know the truth. Even though they'll fight against it, they, uh, they, um, mm -hmm. they, they, they even joke about it, whatever. But the truth is they're seeking truth. And that's what was attractive. All these people, they knew all these rules that the Pharisees had and the Sadducees, and they knew all of this stuff. But they were listening and following John because his message was clear. It was different. It was it had more truth to it. And yeah. it did. So anyway, I think that for us today, I think no matter what society is doing, obey God, follow God, don't get caught up in the trends, just stay focused on God's word and um, tell people the truth about what God's word says. Right. And he did tell the truth. Yes. Yeah. Then here comes the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yeah. Here they come and, you know, I don't know if you can imagine like, you know, your pastor or or one of us or something standing up in in church on Sunday and calling everybody a brood of vipers. You probably I could do that. Um, Paul might do that. I probably wouldn't do that. So, but you know, it he was he was inflammatory. He was like, this is bold, and yeah. he's calling out the actual leaders of religion, the leaders of the synagogues, and he's like. I mean, a brood of vipers probably doesn't sound that harsh, but I think it was quite harsh at, at the time. time. Yeah, at, that at the time. time. Yeah, for yeah, sure. he was. Yeah. like well, they were. They were thinking that was very blasphemous. And then he's. And then he's saying, like, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So he's also kind of saying, like, you don't even know. You don't even know. You guys don't even know what's going on. You're so far out of the picture. Um, and then he talks about bear fruit keeping with repentance and so um you know it, it it's going to talk a little bit more about the 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 fruit and the tree here in in verse 10 but he says right away like you can't just claim that you're abraham's kids um like you, you can't just claim that because that that's not gonna that's not gonna work this time and he says you know i can say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. He's like, that's that doesn't cut it. Yeah. Well, and um, the brood of um, vipers. Vipers. Remember that the snake represents sin, mm -hmm. and saying that they're, basically they're the offspring is what one translation says: the offspring of vipers. You're the offspring of Satan um, mm -hmm. doing evil. And I, I, they understood that. They understood what he was saying. It yeah. was we don't understand it as much today because, but they knew that here they are saying they're of God, and he's like, "You're the offspring of a snake. Um, you're evil." Uh, yes. What's John say? Um, you might say that Billy Graham was a modern day John the Baptist because God mightily used Billy Graham like into John the Baptist. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He uh, he started a whole new way of um, yeah kind of relating and helping us to relate to we, Jesus, right? We just went to, um, um, what's the castle? <laughs> just went blank. The castle that we went to. Um, it was owned by... Um, the castle? The castle of Northern California. Oh, my. Hertz. Hertz Castle. Thank Hertz. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hertz. Um, Hertz. And I don't know how you say it. that's the guy that really pushed um, Billy, Billy Graham. Graham. Um, and that guy, from what I understood wasn't really a believer he was just very um, whatever he said all the news channels took it because he was the, he was the big influential. guy <laughs> yeah. yeah and he said it and um so it was 
Puff Billy Graham or something like that, whatever that it told everybody, okay, follow this guy. And that really set that off. And um, just with that, and so God can use anything like that, to, even a person that doesn't even know they're following God's word. So Billy Graham all of a sudden has well, got all these people um, listening to him and following him. Yeah, and then, in the news, in the uh, magazines, yeah, he yeah. was, he got elevated. Yeah, um, and then became the, the president's um, pastor pretty much. I mean, it's... Yeah, um, when oh. presidents were still Christian. Yeah, 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 back in that day. Yeah, <laughs> back when they back when they uh, they asked God for for favor and wisdom. Yeah. Um, so he's talking about these vipers, and now he's talking about um, the trees, and he's saying the axe is laid on the root of the tree, and so if you don't bear good fruit, um, you're going to be thrown into the fire. And you know, if you think about it, God's message has not changed since the Old Testament, and he says, you know you'll be judged for your unproductive lives. God calls us to be active in our obedience. And John compared people who claim they believe God, but don't live for God, to unproductive trees that will be cut down. Um, you know, how productive are you for God? Sure. Because you, it, you might be a tree, you might have even some decent roots, and you need to, you need to produce fruit. That is your job while you are here on this earth. After you become a believer, um, after you become a follower, sorry, a believer, then a follower, um, because Satan's a believer. And so we've talked a lot about that. Like, if you say a believer, like, I'm no longer impressed when people say that they're a believer. Tell me you're a follower. And then show me you're a follower. Let me see the fruit of, of your ministry. Let me see the fruit of your obedience to God. That's what he's talking about here. And he's talking about, he's talking to the most religious people of the day, religious people of the yeah. day. Right. And they're in the synagogue and they're doing the, you know, the sacrifices and they're, you know, reading the, the Torah in the synagogue and, and all of these things. And he's like, yeah, but you don't produce fruit, so... You're going in the fire. Yeah. I think that's um, one of the things we do at our house church. So if you don't know about our house church, um, we help people plant house churches. That's our goal um, yeah. so that you can um, worship right where you live and more of your friends and family will come to your house before they come to a church building. It's just it's just common um, thing. But in that, we, we have this where we call it harvest share. And it's where every week... We pray for the people that we witnessed to, shared the gospel with, um, came in contact with, non-Christians. So mm -hmm. who did you contact this week that was not a believer that you shared the gospel with? And it's almost embarrassing when you go a couple of weeks and you have no one, right? And I think that's, that accountability is, it cuts right to the heart, man. It's like, Wow, yeah, this is I'm what convicted. he's talking about. Yeah. It's like we're not producing anything. We haven't shared the gospel in two weeks, in three weeks. And then eventually you realize months have gone by and I have not shared the gospel. And whenever we do it, we can't use it, even though I try when I don't have any. Um, I try to say, but I preached on the stage behind us. I preached. Um, I, I shared the gospel. No, it's when did you go out and reach people with the gospel, you know, it's my job to preach, but it's not what I should, I don't have to do that when I, in my everyday life because I'm a preacher. Yes, but because God's word. Yes, I do. And I need to be sharing. It's like the guy at 7-Eleven, the guy at the, the taco shop, um, the lady that's um, walking down the street, carrying her groceries, pushing the um, cart, whatever. Just how do you share the gospel? And I think that's what he's talking about. It's like, it's not producing fruit in yourself. Oh, I'm a better person because I became a believer. No, it's what have you done? Um, eventually we're going to hear a commandment from Jesus himself before he goes back to heaven that says, um, go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. That's a command. <laughs> it's not a suggestion. It's not like, um, Hey, um, do something good today. No, yeah. he says, go and make disciples and, um, share the gospel, share the good news. Um, let's see. John says, I don't ask people if they are a Christian or born again. I just ask them where they are have their fellowship at and their relationship um, 
with God. Yeah, okay. with God. So, um, yeah, I mean, whatever your uh, whatever your way of doing it is, it's just your intro share, line. Share share yeah. the gospel. The thing that we're we cut out with Harvest is people would always say at our at our ch- house church, it just me. Oh yeah, me and so and so. Um, I prayed for her this week. Well, she's a Christian. <laughs> I mean, it's like you didn't lead anybody to Christ. I mean, that's just good fellowship between Christians, and we, we're yeah. open. It's like go into the field, the battlefield, where people are not believers. So, but, and if that's, like John says, I mean, it doesn't have to be a story. Hey, are you a believer or not? No, just like you said, hey, where do you go to church? Where do you fellowship? And then, oh, no, I don't go to church. Well, there you go. <laughs> Let's start from there. Here's your end. Oh, John put something else. Let's see. I think it's the pastor's job to teach the congregation how to go out and be witnesses for God. And yes, and we, that's what I'm saying. In house church, we do that. I'm not, I am pushing house church, totally didn't plan on this, but it just happens to fall in place. Um, at house church, we truly believe that that teaching that we do prepares you to go out and share the gospel. We give you the easy tools, and I mean super easy tools, to go out and share the gospel. And it's so easy that if you can draw three circles, um, you can share the gospel. If um, if you can, um, in 15 seconds, tell how Jesus changed your life, which you can because we can show you how to do this. You can witness to somebody just by telling them your story. Um, and we have it down to 15 seconds for a purpose, and we can explain that another time. Um, but there's a 15-second testimony about your life. So there's so many good, good ways, and we do believe that. We believe we are to teach you to go out and share the gospel. We do not believe that we need to teach you how to bring somebody to church so we can preach a sermon to hopefully they get saved. <laughs> it's just, why, why, not you, why don't you just witness to people while you're out? You know? yeah. But you, you can, can bring them, that, you can yeah, bring them you to can church. Yeah. But that's, there you go. The goal is you're probably the better person to lead somebody to Christ than bringing them to church and hope that we can. Because God put them in front of you. Yeah. That's actually the truth. God put them in front of you. All right, well, let's go ahead and I'm just going to read two verses here, Matthew 3, 11 and 12. And it says, as for me, and this is John the Baptist talking, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So this is um, this is what he's talking about. Uh, what why John the Baptist? Um, he's he's just chatting, right? He's like, yeah. okay, so um, and maybe he's still talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. But he said, but there is one coming who's going to be mightier than I am. We know who that is. That's Jesus Christ. And he says he's not going to be fit to remove his sandals. And he talks about he will baptize you with but, the hold. John the Baptist is not fit to uh, untie Jesus' sandals. It sounds like sorry. Jesus can't. He's not fit to undo his sandals. T- <laughs> oh, Jesus can take off his own sandals, yeah. but John the Baptist. Or maybe I'm the only one that heard that. I just, no, no, just... no. If you're confused, that means everybody is. Sorry about that. Yeah. But yeah, so John the Baptist is not fit to remove his shoes, basically, is what he's saying. So he's just putting himself on That's the pecking his, order here. He's a very humble guy. He understands. Very humble. That's right. It didn't go to his head. No, and then he says that Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Um, and so if you have, if you have been saved, um, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And, um, and so, you know, so this is very important, obviously, a very important part to being a Christian because we alone don't have the power to live as we should. We have to have the power of Jesus Christ in us to do the living, um, to do the following, to be obedient, um, yeah. and the Holy Spirit makes that possible each and every day. Yeah. Um, so there's this is this is affects many churches, and wherever your stance is on this, it's, it's all good. It's not a heaven or hell issue, but baptism. John is telling us here, he baptizes with water for repentance. It is different than when Jesus dies on the cross, 
he raise, uh, he'll rise again, and then he, he will actually baptize us with his spirit. And that's what the water represented previous to this. Until then, you did not receive the Holy Spirit in your heart. The Holy Spirit did not live within us, and that's the difference. And when Jesus, when we accept Jesus, we will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, different than water baptism. And in fact, the disciples eventually are going to say, oh, were you baptized with the Holy Spirit? And people are going to say, no, just with John's um, baptism yeah. of repentance. They're two separate things. Um, the one is representing what the other's going to do. So John's baptism was great. It was. It just wasn't the, it, it was, um, what did Jerry call it yesterday when he makes, um, before they actually do it, uh, before they do the big project, they create a, yeah. um, like a template, no, like yeah. a, like a model. Yeah, like a model before they go on. Yeah. So they use the cheaper product to make sure it's going to work. And then, um, and then whenever they're going to do the full on thing, they use all the um, expensive quality and everything like that. And not to put down prototype. the- Prototype. Yeah, prototype. That's what, thank you. So it I'm just terrible with words today. I don't know what it is. But, um, but it's like, this was representing something bigger. This mm -hmm. was like getting you prepared for when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, once he died on the cross, he fulfilled um, what he came here to do, we can now have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, and his temple is now you. You, He lives inside of you. This did not happen previous to his death and resurrection. So I, I think John clears it up right here. Some people believe like life or death, water baptism is you're not saved until you get baptized. I don't believe that. Um, with water. I do believe you're not saved if you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I do believe that because once you get saved, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that baptizes you. It's, it's that. I still say that you should be baptized outwardly. It's a great sign for what happens on the inside. Mm -hmm. But um, to say you wouldn't go to heaven because you didn't get water, water baptized, I think that's a stretch for scripture, but um, I know that... Some denominations feel you know, differently oh, I've, had them, about I've had them tell me. I've had them yeah. tell me several times. Oh, you're lying to the people. You're saying they're saved because they asked Christ in their life and they started to follow him, but they didn't get baptized. So they're not actually saved yet. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. You want to read our... Uh, okay, got a couple down here. Let's see. Um, Good gravy, Rich. Hey, Rich. All right. Nice to see you both, Paul and Tina. Um, you're both amazing. Well... That's Jesus. Yeah. Uh, but thanks, man. Yeah. That's nice. That's, That's the kind of lies that I think are okay. When you lie a little bit like that. Yeah. <laughs> brother, brother. Those little white lies are saying we're amazing. That's good. But, go. um, all right. John says, um, but thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, John says, I know a person that was witness to another per person, and then he called the pastor. I need you to come over, and I need you to say the sinner's prayer w with that guy and get him saved. And the pastor said, I'm not coming over. It's your job to pray, <laughs> pray with him in salvation and to tell more, um, uh, tell me more about it tomorrow. Yeah, that's boom, done. And people think that that's harsh, but you know, honestly, this person was presented to you um, to, to talk to about Jesus and maybe to lead them in the sinner's yeah. prayer. Don't, don't, don't get all twisted up. The sinner's prayer is, hey, you know, you can say repeat after me or whatever, is that I, re I repent and I believe. Yeah. That's it. That's the whole prayer. I repent and from my bad stuff and I believe in you, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, amen. And then, That's the sinner's prayer. Don't get messed up. And then connect them with your pastor. Connect yeah, them yeah, with people, yeah. um, other Christians. Um, let them grow in their faith by... Um, using the wisdom and knowledge of mature Christians. I mean, this is this is the community that you get into. But to actually lead somebody to Christ, that's on us. That's on all of us. Uh, we are to lead people to Christ. Um, Philip went out. He baptized somebody. I don't even think that was the Philip that was actually the apostle. I could be wrong, but I think that's just um, there is a Philip the apostle. There's um, yeah. a, disciples. Some other um, dudes. And, and then there was other people baptizing. I just. I just see that God's using all of us. He's not just using, oh, the guy on the stage. Yeah, he does all that. No, no, no. Um, we're called, we are all called to be ambassadors. So, And the other thing we teach at House Church is 
Um, when you become a believer, two things happen. You become an ambassador for Christ, and you become a new creation. Those two things happen. When you become a new creation, you're no longer living the way you used to live, and then um, on top of that, you now become a spokesperson for Christ. So that's scriptural. That's what it says, and we need First to live Corinthians. by that. There you go. Um, yeah, so anyway, so uh, and then the winnowing fork is... It's a pitchfork, right, that used to kind of toss wheat in the air and then the chaff would uh, separate from it. And so that's what he's talking about. He's going to separate the good and the bad, and, uh, and the bad is going into the fire. Um, I was talking to Paul about the end of verse 11 right before we started and um, how it says Jesus will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. And... and um, I was reading a commentator and he was talking about how he feels that this fire, because he doesn't say like fire or as unto fire, which is how it is, how the tongues of fire are referred to on Pentecost. It says they were like fire. They were as unto fire. It doesn't say they were actual fire. It says they were like fire. Here it doesn't say that. Here it says fire. So. The commentary I was reading um, was he was saying that Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit, and then at some point he's coming back for judgment, and he will baptize with fire, meaning you will be judged. And that's and then they talk about this threshing floor, the winnowing fork, about how he's separating the the good from the evil. So I don't know how you feel about that or or what the thing says to you, but you know, but. Everyone one day will be baptized, either now by God's Holy Spirit or later by the fire of his judgment. And, uh, and so just, it's in Acts chapter 2, 3. You can go back and read about Pentecost. It doesn't say fire. It says like fire. So just an interesting side note. And when we read and we study the Bible, sometimes we pick up things we haven't seen in the past. Feel free to put stuff in the comments if you think I'm wrong or if you think I'm crazy or if that's something you've never heard before. I think that was a little bit new for me. I've always just assumed that they were talking about Pentecost till this commentator said, go back and read it about Pentecost again because, because that's not exactly what it says. Well, Rich says, um, I'm not familiar with the sinner's prayer. And he says, but I do know that I am a sinner. Um, so Rich, it's here's- not in the Bible, right? No, so let's just um, no. clarify what we're, we're using Christianese. You know how Sorry. we Christians just throw out these things. Um, there's no specific prayer called the center prayer. It's it's a prayer, a prayer, and we just give it a title. Um, what's it? It's that prayer that you pray to God to really tell Him how you feel and ask Him to be the Lord of your life. And the, the true the, the true um, Christian um, conversion to convert from a sinner um, to a Christian is to believe. Like that's what. Sinner. Sorry. <laughs> so, to to become a Christian, um, living your sinful life, and to to become a Christian, uh, the Bible says, um, "Whosoever believes." Um, right. Uh, the Bible also says, "If um, you will confess." with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you um, will be saved. So that's what that means. So a sinner's prayer, we just say, what's that conversation like that you're going to have with God? And so first of all, as the Bible says, you must believe uh, what the Bible says and you must confess. Um, you must confess that you're a sinner. Like you, like you mentioned here, I'm a sinner. I'm turning to you. Um, it says, um, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you must believe what the scripture says, that Jesus actually came here, died, and rose again. So you must believe that to be a Christian. Um, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, just this right here is the whole thing. It's not just saying, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was a good guy. I believe he was a prophet. I believe No, that's not what it's saying. It's like, you believe he's Lord of your life. That means you no longer a lord of your life. 
you're no longer making the decisions on your own to live this worldly life that whatever you feel you're going to do, you're now looking to Jesus as your Lord mm -hmm. to say, God, how do you want me to do this? Um, I need you, give me the instructions. Well, he does through the Bible. So we read the Bible, we learn scripture, but he also, now that you're a Christian, he lives inside your heart and you start feeling that guilt. If you do something wrong, you look at the wrong um, thing on the website and you start looking oh, like, oh no, God doesn't want me on this page. You go to it, you know, you get off of that page, right? Um, you leave. Um, then it, So it's just God leading you and directing you. So the actual sinner's prayer, I'm going a long ways to tell this, but um, this, there's no place in the Bible that calls it a sinner's prayer. It's just how do you have that conversation with God to say, I'm stepping down from controlling my own life and I'm putting it in your hands. I believe yeah. in you and here's the key to salvation. You must believe, but not like Satan does because he always he, he knows God exists. You must be a follower and that's what the difference is. You must repent and follow Jesus Christ and that's really it. Just, yeah. So, however I mean, you word that, we we John give is examples. The same thing, okay. Sinner's prayer is just what um, just what it says. It's a sinner's prayer asking for God's salvation. That's the sinner's prayer, and it can be that's it. Anything where you're just humbly asking God to be the Lord of your life, and that you're going to put trust and faith in Him, and you're going to follow Him. That's the key. Follow Christ. Just from the minute that you repent, start seeking the way God wants you to live in your life. Yeah. Great, uh, great point, um, Rich. Great question. That was good. Yeah, sometimes we say things. Hopefully that helps. If it doesn't, uh, for one, you can click on um, request prayer, and John will talk to you more about it online, or you, you know our number. You can just give us a call, too, and we can talk to you. Anytime. All right, well, let's go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. So uh, Matthew 3, I'm going to read 13 to 17, which is the end here. So uh, Matthew 3, 13 starts, then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized for, by you, and you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered, saying to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it was fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So um, I think the, the question that people love to ask, that I love to ask, is why? Why was Jesus baptized? <laughs> like, why was he baptized? Clearly, John wasn't divine. Good guy, fantastic guy, you know, preaching repentance and, and baptizing people. But why would Jesus need to be baptized, right? And so it says that he was confessing sin on behalf of the nation, as Nehemiah, Ezra, Moses, and Daniel had done. Um, he was showing support for what John was doing, because clearly John was called by God. He was the, the last Old Testament prophet. Um, he was inaugurating his public ministry, Jesus' public ministry. He's like, okay, let's, let's kick this off. And then he was identifying with the penitent people of God, not with the critical Pharisees, right, who were only watching. Jesus, the perfect man, didn't need baptism for sin because he never sinned. But he accepted baptism in obedience, service to the Father, and God showed his approval directly after. So, um, so while Jesus didn't need baptizing, um, I believe that he did it for these reasons that I kind of outlined just real quickly because he was like, I need to show the example here. He was even an yeah. example. So, yes, all of the above. And um, I think that, um, I, I think it kind of, mm -hmm. see, I don't think that Jesus being baptized would have washed away any sins that way because it didn't. Um, it, it was a, a sign of what's to come. That's my belief. That's the way I feel. Um, I think it's showing. And I think Jesus was going through that showing um, 
that sign of it because he is going to carry the sin of the world. Remember, even though he's committed no sin, he's going to carry that. So I think that's a sign of the baptism um, to come. I think mm -hmm. that that's part of that. Um, it is that repentance. I think that it was necessary because it says right here, allow it at this time for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And I think it was at this time, this was the right thing the people would do mm -hmm. at that time. That was that was what they knew. That was what John had been teaching, yeah. preparing them for what's to come, which is going to come. Mm -hmm. The apostles are going to start comparing the two, um, this new baptism of the Holy Spirit versus the baptism of repentance. Um, you're going to see that comparison. And I think Jesus is just going through. And, and what if what if he walked into your church where you're at and he's called your church to do um specific things which he does he calls all churches to have their own gifts and their own um, talents that they're using um what if he comes in there and he just said nah, i don't really want to do this you know what i think if he would have went up to john and just kind of walked away or whatever i just think john would have been like man i've been out here doing this you told me to do this <laughs> um you know kind of thing and so I, I i believe that was a great encouragement to john we know that john um just shortly after this is going to start questioning his um, um, his thinking is I mean Jesus is going to have to lift him up mm -hmm. um, because he's going to go into this depression kind of a thing which a lot of the prophets did a lot of pastors do they get into this am I am I doing the right thing am I am I saying the right stuff I mean that kind of thing so Jesus is going to have to lift John up later but I think this was encouragement to him as well I don't want to downplay it I think Jesus had a specific reason to do this but i think there's yeah. so much more into it that we can get out of it that look how much jesus just humbled himself to be baptized by a person that had sin and he didn't oh, yeah. that's one thing um another thing is that a great example for us um it's it's okay we need to go we need to be baptized even with water as a as a great sign and um sign, yeah. here's the thing that i was thinking um Jesus is coming up to be baptized by John. <laughs> I mean, I know how nervous I get when like I'm here and maybe your family comes in or somebody somebody important that you know comes in and you have to preach or you have to um do something and just like Oh my, I mean, I don't want to mess this up. I mean, so what did John feel like when Jesus, I mean, what if I hold him under too long? I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, what if, what if I lose the grip? I, I mean, anything that just, just knowing it's Jesus and you're baptizing Jesus. Oh my goodness. I mean, well, but I think no it's, pressure. It's pretty amazing though. Cause you know, Jesus shows up, John's doing a good job. Yeah. Like he's got a lot of followers. He's really popular. He's doing the things. Then Jesus shows up and, you know, and John had to be obedient. And I think John really showed his integrity here because Jesus said, no, you need to, you need to baptize me. And he said, okay. And this is kind of like you were saying, like, this is the first step of, of actually John's, um, John's ministry is, well, he says it, he says, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Yeah. And literally, John is going to hand all of his followers right over to Jesus. And, you know, can we do that today? Can we just say, hey, you know, like everything I've worked so hard for in ministry or in whatever, I'm just handing over to Jesus. Like John did that. And it started here with this obedience to Jesus and saying, yep, you, you need me to baptize you. I don't understand because I'm not worthy, but I will do it. And um, yeah. Good. Well, I'll say this um, just in connection. Jesus does this for John mm -hmm. and kind of, no, you're, you baptize me. But remember, he's later on going to do something similar with Peter where he's going to wash Peter's feet. <laughs> Peter's yeah. like, you're not washing my feet. He goes, no, I have to wash your feet. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it's just that being mm -hmm. humble. And I mean, Christ was a, what a great example I'm going to finish with this, I, um, unless you want to take this as... Um, no, no, go ahead. The Trinity. Yeah, it, and it's... Um, this is the mention of the Trinity right here. Uh, this is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, in Christianese, that's what we call the Trinity. Um, it's the three... Um, three um, 
that make up the one God. There is not three gods. There's one God. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Different roles, different person, um, different purpose. Or um, like, for example, God the Father is not God the Son. Uh, that they have two different roles. Um, the Son is not the Spirit. There, it's three different roles that they have. And how does that make sense? It, only God can do this. But I can say that he made an example through us is I am a father, I am a husband, um, and I'm a pastor. I mean, it's like I have three different roles. that I, I'm one person, but I have these three different roles in my life. Jesus came here. Um, he's still God, but he came here as human, and he's still God, but he's also 100% human. It's so weird, but only God can do it, and that's what I think makes it so good is if God could only do the things that we could do, then it's not so... What would we much, need God yeah, for? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's well, so big about that? But the fact that God can be three and one, um, just amazing. And and this goes all the way back to creation where um, when God said, let's make man in our image. And like it's God. like our image. It's, yeah, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So here they are. They're present right here with um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all at the end here. So Karen says, shows Jesus' identification with sinners and the need to be baptized. Absolutely. He was identifying with us. He was identifying with John. He was identifying with humanity and being that perfect example. And then I love how it says, like, Jesus came up immediately from the water, kind of what Paul was saying. Behold, the heavens were opened. So the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. So that's the Spirit the Father is, it says, the voice from the heavens. Behold, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And then this, the Son, right, Jesus, um, he's the one being baptized. So yeah. just as Paul was saying, all three are shown in, in this section yeah. of Scripture. And it's important to always kind of hone in on those places where we see the Trinity being um, shown um, because yeah. it, it's one of the foundations of Christianity is that we believe in the tr in the Trinity. And um, there's a, there's a lot of um, mainstream organizations that say they believe in Jesus, um, but they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. And just I I don't know that or Jesus was divine. Or yeah. All the, I mean, they go further and say Jesus was just a prophet, Jesus was just a good person, but the fact that there's a there's people out there that don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. They believe in God the Father, God the Son, or Jesus the Son. Um, so it's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And and Holy Spirit is yeah. not an it, by the way. <laughs> when we talk about, oh, it, nope, nope, nope. Um, it, he, um, he represents as a he. Um, Jesus, uh, Jesus is he, the Spirit is he, and the Father is he. Um, I know I was in getting my master's degree at um, the U Christian University, and, um, and I say that with sarcasm. But um, and when I when I said he, everybody um, goes, oh she, you know, they want to change the pronouns. No, um, it, God has represented Himself as uh, male, and that's how we respect that. And um, they say everybody gets to choose their pronouns except for God, I guess. But anyway, all right, let's see what John says here. I think Jesus going to be baptized was a public record, uh, recognizing him because John told them who he was. Um, he saw him coming as the dove landed on him, and then God spoke that whole whole lot of stuff fulfilled there. Yeah, there was a whole lot of stuff. That's a Georgia way of putting it. A whole lot of stuff uh, fulfilled. And just like Matthew is, that's yeah. how he's writing this he's, whole letter. He is showing the Israelites this is the fulfillment of, of everything that was done before. This is why Jesus is the one. This is why Jesus is the one. This is why Jesus yeah. is the one. Don't miss it. And, um, and so, yeah, it's all important. Well, that was the study of Matthew 3. Huh? Matthew 3. There we go. Yeah.